So we're going to begin now um, the first of our three uh, subtopics under um, the general topic heading of utilitarianism. The first two of these subtopics take us into very famous discussions that form part of the most famous historical presentation of a utilitarian position, the one given by John Stuart Mill. They are specifically uh, chapter two, where Mill talks about higher and lower pleasures, and then a bit later we'll be turning to chapter four, where he talks about the proof of utilitarianism. It helps, actually, especially in setting up the higher and lower pleasures discussion, to provide just a little bit of um, historical biographical background. Because the higher and lower pleasures discussion is one key place in which Mill is um, modifying, in a certain way, reacting against Benthamite utilitarianism. Okay, so. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, and I'll, I'll give you a PowerPoint on this in a while, but um, Jeremy Bentham, who lived from 1748 to 1832, is the, he's, I mean, he's the founder of modern utilitarianism, and he's sort of the first completely explicit, committed philosophical utilitarian. He's by no means the first person in the history of moral philosophy to have a broadly utilitarian view. As we'll see in a while, uh, Mill standardly refers to um, Epicureans, followers of the ancient philosopher Epicurus, as a sort of another term for utilitarians. And you know, there are other figures through the history of moral philosophy who in various ways um, anticipate or um, partly accept a utilitarian view. Bentham, though, is sort of the first absolutely explicit committed utilitarian. He's an interesting character, Bentham. He's not... Um, not a normal or paradigm philosopher in lots of ways. He... Um, oh. He, um, if his writing is um, very empirical, extremely sort of painstaking. And I suppose there's a certain sort of philosophical temperament that's like this, but as um, Mill points out in an essay on Bentham, Bentham is really not good at all at seeing where the other side is coming from. If you look at, you know, his treatment of why anyone might oppose utilitarianism, he you know, he has very little ability to kind of get inside um, the heads of his opponents, as it were. Yeah. Bentham's, um, Bentham's interests, too, were um, not at all, as you might say, narrowly philosophical, right? I mean, he, he wrote general defenses of a utilitarian view. But he also um, was engaged in um, oh, various other political and social projects. So he's very interested in uh, legal reform. Right? And quite interested in um, prison design. Right? So he, he actually had a, I mean, He's, he, he's writing and thinking at a time right when, um, oh, the sort of standard punishments in uh, Britain and other parts of the Western world are kind of moving away from uh, corporal punishment and towards imprisonment, right? And so he he had this design for prison, the panopticon, the general idea was that you could, um, you know, you had a sort of central area from which you could see all the prisoners who were all in solitary and whatnot, right? And he, and he spent, um, 
oh, 20 years trying to sell this to various governments, including like Tsarist Russia and stuff. As well as you know, writing voluminously on um, constitutional issues as well. Yeah. He's also um, one of the first explicit philosophical atheists, um, and um, for uh, that reason, partly he. Um, set up in his will for his body to be mummified and preserved, the, the, the Bentham auto icon. And actually, if you, if you go on the web and you search for Jeremy Bentham auto icon, you can see, you can see pictures of him. Right? He's, um, he's not in the best shape, I gather. I haven't looked at one of those pictures recently. It's, uh, that, I mean, that, that, um, that mummifying craft, right? It, you know, there are better and worse examples of it in general, right? I mean, you know, they did like Lenin rather well, right? And there was, there was, I'm getting way off topic. There's a guy, there's a guy who's like a communist dictator in Guyana, I think. And the, you know, the Soviets tried preserving him, but it's much hotter over there and they did a much worse job. Um, you know, but, but Bentham, still, like I say, he's, he's still, he's still preserved, little job. Um, Bentham um, had, um, oh, according to the taste, sort of very down to earth or philistine attitude about pleasure, right? The, the thing, right? Pleasure, happiness, the utilitarian thinks the only thing that's valuable, right? Specifically, he famously said that. I don't, I don't know if this is the exact quotation, but it's roughly right. Um, quantity of pleasure being equal, pushpin is just as good as poetry. Pushpin is um, 18th century kids' game. Right? His point is, if you enjoy that, just as good as poetry. Okay, so we, we could we could pop over to the PowerPoint. So we got sort of um, some a little bit of the background here on Bent. Um, so, uh, John Stuart Mill is the next great figure in the utilitarian tradition after Bentham. Bentham's influence on John Stuart Mill, though, was um, much more than uh, much more than a sort of purely intellectual one, right? Um, in that John Stuart Mill's father, James Mill, was a close associate of Bentham's. They, you know, worked together and were, um, for a good while, uh, you know, lived on the same street in London. And uh, partly at uh, Bentham's design, 
John Stewart was the subject of a kind of educational experiment. So his father gave him an extremely accelerated education, starting him learning stuff you know, much earlier than kids standardly do. The details are in John Stuart Mill's autobiography. Don't remember them exactly, but you know the, the kind of thing is he sort of he's lear you know he's learning Latin at four and you know mastering Greek at seven and by nine and ten he's already you know doing higher mathematics and he's reading political philosophy and what and then he had the job of teaching his younger siblings of whom there were a good number. Uh, that. Um, upbringing had uh, what you might think of as predictable consequences, right? I mean, on the one hand, Mill emerged enormously um, erudite, right? And went on to be one of the major intellectual figures of the 19th century, right? Certainly, um, uh, you know, probably the leading intellectual force in mid-Victorian Britain. But, I mean, if, you know, if you get a childhood like that, you miss out on the chance to, you know, play like ordinary kids do, right? And perhaps for that reason, um, at the age of about 20, Mill had a kind of breakdown. In um, coming out of that breakdown, writers became important to him who were very different from Bentham, including some of the English romantics. Right? And one thing that Mill came to think was that uh, Bentham's utilitarianism was in a way too crude, and that some of these romantic insights needed to be uh, taken into account to make the utilitarian view uh, more persuasive. And the place in utilitarianism where you find that sort of amendment most directly is in this uh, passage in the second chapter, to which we'll turn in just a sec, where Mill is talking about higher and lower pleasures. Um, a word about the text of utilitarianism. Uh, we've got this extract from it, uh, pages 30 to 39 in the right thing to do. Utilitarianism has that, um, that nice virtue in a philosophical classic of being pretty short, actually, even in the original. It's like, um, I mean, it's five chapters, right? It was, so, it, I mean, if we had the whole thing in here, it would probably only take 40 or 50 pages. It was, it was actually published originally um, chapter by chapter in a periodical, right? So, you know, the readers of this educated periodical, you know, got uh, one installment each month or whatever it was. So that was actually, a, I mean, it's a fairly common um, Victorian English publishing format, right? Lots of Dickens' novels came out that way as well. Um, so it's written in certain ways for a popular audience. Right? As I say, five chapters, we have extracts from two of them, chapter two and chapter four, and, you know, those are among the most famous and celebrated bits. Wait, one more thing sort of pet peeve of mine, and of other people's actually, but in this connection. Um, just, this is just about what his name was, okay? So the chap's name, his last name, the author of Utilitarianism, one, Mill, okay, M-I-L-L, -L, right? Now, I mean, there's another, I'm sure, etymologically, historically closely related name, Mills, M-I-L-L-S. Perfectly fine name, but nothing against people whose name is Mills, but his wasn't, okay, his was Mill, all right? Um, I will 
and you will uh, say mills on various occasions and that will consistently be the, the, the possessive, right? So it'll be M-I-L-L apostrophe S, as in Mill's proof or Mill's distinction between higher and lower pleasures. This should not be taken to imply that his name was M-I-L-L-S. Last name, perfectly fine last name wasn't his. Right? In a version of this that I've actually recently encountered, which I found even more curious, it should not be taken to um, imply that his last name was M-I-L-L apostrophe S. Right, I actually had someone do that one too. And I mean, that's a very non-standard last name, right? But again, that wasn't his. Perf I mean, I'm not sure that that one is a perfectly fine last name. It definitely wasn't his last name, okay? All right. So, um, in order to uh, understand the stuff on higher and lower pleasures, an experience suggests that um, uh, it takes a little work to understand Mill and his Victorian prose. Right? In order to understand it, you've got to see the way in which there are um, oh, sort of three stages in the discussion. Right? This is the key discussion um, beginning on page 30 and you can get to the main part and the main flavor of what Mill's doing by early on page 32. Okay. So, um, three stages, go to the PowerPoint. Well, hang on, don't go to the PowerPoint. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll, I'll do the PowerPoint afterwards. Right. So, um, let's do it this way. Uh, what I'll do is I'll read you what he says, and then I'll try and get you to tell me what he means, okay? All right, so the first stage, first move in the discussion, right, what Mill does is he raises an objection to, a criticism of utilitarianism, okay? He does this in the paragraph that goes from page 30 over to page 31 in The Right Thing to Do. I shall in just a tick read it to you, and then I'll ask you, okay, so what's the objection? What's the problem for utilitarianism that Mill is here raising? So here's what he says. Now, such a theory of life, that's utilitarianism, excites in many minds, and among them in some of the most estimable in feeling and purpose, inveterate dislike. To suppose that life has, as they express it, no higher end and pleasure, no better and nobler object of desire and pursuit. They designate as utterly mean and groveling, as a doctrine worthy only of swine, to whom the followers of Epicurus, that's utilitarians, right, were at a very early period contemptuously likened. And modern holders of the doctrine are occasionally made the subject of equally polite comparisons by its German, French, and English assailants. Okay, so what's the objection? What does the critic or opponent of utilitarianism that Mill here refers to say? What, what, what does that person say is wrong with utilitarianism? Yes? That to follow nothing but pleasure is to make ourselves like animals. Yes, very good. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's basically exactly right. I mean, the idea is, um, as I like to put it, and I'll, I'll give you this on the PowerPoint in just a sec, but um, the idea is that it's sort of a degrading view, right? Because it implies that all there is to human life is mere animal pleasure. Exactly so. Indeed, we could um, we could pop over to the PowerPoint at this at this stage, right? So this is the first stage of the discussion. Yeah. What Mill does is to raise this objection.
All right, good. So, um, the next thing Mill does is, at some length, well, anyway, for most of the next paragraph, to tell you how any standard utilitarian like Bentham can respond to this objection. This goes from the start of that next paragraph through, to this, which is the main paragraph on 31, right? Through, oh, to maybe three quarters of the way to the bottom where Mill says, and on all these points, utilitarians have fully proved their case. I'm going to follow the same procedure. I'm going to read you what Mill here says, and then I'll ask you, okay, so how, according to Mill here, can any standard utilitarian respond to this objection? What are the key ideas in the key parts of the response? So Mill says, when thus attacked, the Epicureans, that's utilitarians, right, have always answered, that it is not they, but their accusers, who represent human nature in a degrading light. Since the accusation supposes human beings to be capable of no pleasures, except those of which swine are capable. If this supposition were true, the charge could not be gainsaid, but would there then be no longer an imputation. For if the sources of pleasure were precisely the same to human beings and to swine, the rule of life, which is good enough for the one, would be good enough for the other. The comparison of the Epicurean life to that of beasts is felt as degrading precisely because a beast's pleasures do not satisfy human beings' conceptions of happiness. Human beings have faculties more elevated than the animal appetites, and when once made conscious of them, do not regard anything as happiness which does not include their gratification. I do not indeed consider the Epicureans to have been by any means faultless in drawing out their scheme of consequences from the utilitarian principle. To do this in any sufficient manner, many Stoic as well as Christian elements require to be included. But there is no known Epicurean theory of life which does not assign to the pleasures of the intellect, of the feelings and imagination, and of the moral sentiments, a much higher value as pleasures than to those of mere sensation. It must be admitted, however, that utilitarian writers in general have placed the superiority of mental over bodily pleasures chiefly in the greater permanency, safety, uncostliness, etc., of the former. That is, in their circumstantial advantages, rather than in their intrinsic nature. And on all these points, utilitarians have fully proved their case. So then, Mill there sketches the way any standard Benthamite utilitarian can respond to the objection. How does that go? What are the key elements of the response he there articulates? On form today, you are, okay? Yeah, have a go. Um, that uh, we are capable of pleasures not, um, not common to animals, that we can uh, be creative, we can investigate things such as science, and we can yeah. serve to... Yeah, good. So look, the first key element, you're quite right, is Mill says, look, any utilitarian can respond to this objection by saying there are distinctively human pleasures. There are sources of pleasure for human beings which are not the same as sources of pleasure for animals. Right? You, there's no reason why a utilitarian is committed to the view that the only sources of pleasure for humans are just the same as sources of pleasure for animals. Right? Good, that's the first thing. Then, towards the end of what I just read, he says a second thing. He says something about sort of the relative value of the distinctively human pleasures as against the animal ones. Someone else tried telling me what that is. Yes? Um, I, think, I think he says that humans value more of intellect. They get more pleasure from intellectual things than bodily things like... Yeah, he, well, he, he says that, I mean, the, the term he uses is sort of circumstantial advantages, right? So he doesn't, he doesn't exactly say necessarily they get more pleasure from them, but he says, he talks about how the distinctively human pleasures are um, safer, last longer, less costly, right? And in that way, they're better. Good. Okay, so, second stage in the discussion then. Um, and again, we, I guess we go to PowerPoint at this at this stage, right? 
so there's the response to the objection that any utilitarian even Bentham can offer has these sort of two elements that are distinctively human pleasures and they have these, as he says, circumstantial advantages over animal pleasures. But, Mill is not satisfied with that. Mill is not content just to leave us with the standard response to the objection that any utilitarian like Bentham could give. Instead, it is at this point that he introduces a distinctive twist on the utilitarian view, a modified version of the utilitarian view, designed to give what he takes to be a better response to the objection. And you can get a decent flavor for what he has in mind here by reading from where we were into the next paragraph after. So starting with, and all, all these points, utilitarians have fully proved their case most of the way down the long middle paragraph of 31, rest of that paragraph, and then the paragraph going over to page 32. He says, And on all these points utilitarians have fully proved their case. But they might have taken the other, and as it may be called, higher ground, with entire consistency. It is quite compatible with the principle of utility to recognize the fact that some kinds of pleasure are more desirable and more valuable than others. It would be absurd that while, in estimating all other things, quality is considered as well as quantity, the estimation of pleasures should be supposed to depend on quantity alone. If I'm asked what I mean by difference of quality and pleasure, or what makes one pleasure more valuable than another merely as a pleasure, except its being greater in amount, there is but one possible answer. Of two pleasures, if there be one, which all or almost all who have experience of both give a decided preference, irrespective of any feeling of moral obligation to prefer it, that is the more desirable pleasure. If one of the two is, by those who are competently acquainted with both, placed so far above the other that they prefer it, even though knowing it to be attended with a greater amount of discontent, and would not resign it for any quantity of the other pleasure which their nature is capable of, we are justified in ascribing to the preferred enjoyment a superiority in quality so far outweighing quantity as to render it, in comparison, of small account. So there you see Mill proposes this new, distinctive, amended version of utilitarianism. He says, on this new distinctive amended view, pleasures differ not just in quantity, but in quality as well. Some pleasures are, to use the standard term here that he uses at various points, higher. Other pleasures are lower. And in some important way that we'll articulate more in a little while, the higher pleasures just count much more. They're much more valuable. 
So that's clearly self-consciously supposed to be something new and different in utilitarianism, right? It's supposed to be a new, as Mill thinks, better way to evaluate pleasures and to respond to this objection that he's been considering. What we need to do now then is to get clearer about how this um, proposed amendment to utilitarianism, this new modified view involving higher and lower pleasures is supposed to work. And we need to ask, is it a good idea? Is it a good idea to um, modify Benthamite utilitarianism the way Mill here proposes, or would you be better off to stick with the original view? The way I propose to discuss this is to raise and then to address in turn five questions about Mill's proposal, five questions about Mill on higher and lower pleasures. I think probably the first thing to do is to you know, uh, introduce you to all the questions, you get them down in your notes, and then, then what we'll do once we've got the list of questions there is we'll, we'll t talk about them in turn. Okay. All right. Oh, um, just before we do that, though, um, you probably ought to put this down as well. So this is, you know, the final thing from getting clear about how the, the original discussion worked, right? Stage three of that original discussion, the introduction of this new idea. back in for sex. So what we're going to do then is we're going to, you know, you're going to first, in, in order to, you know, do a critical discussion here, right, first we're going to list the questions and then we're going to take them in turn. All right. So we can pop back to the PowerPoint and we've got the first three of our five questions.
Uh, everyone got these first three questions down? All right. So complete the list, list then. Fourth and fifth question. Everyone got these down? Okay. So um, let's think about them in turn. I'll begin with the, the first one, which we don't need to go back to PowerPoint. You all got, you all got this in your notes, right? Um, our first question then was the question, what kinds of experience does Mill think of as higher pleasures and what kinds does he think of as lower pleasures? Here... You can get um, sort of three related contrasts from that long middle paragraph on 31 that we've already looked at, right? That I've read to you and we've talked about some already. Specifically, um, If you look about halfway down that paragraph, uh, just below the middle on 31, he says, that, but there is no known Epicurean theory of life which does not assign to the pleasures of the intellect, to the feelings and imagination, and of the moral sentiments, a much higher value as pleasures than to those of mere sensation. So that suggests the contrast Mill has in mind is this. The kinds of experience he thinks of as higher pleasures, those are going to be the pleasures of the intellect, or the feelings and imagination of the moral sentiments. By contrast, the kinds he thinks of as lower pleasures, those are going to be pleasures of mere sensation. Right? Second, sort of pretty immediately after that, he talks about the superiority of mental over bodily pleasures. That again suggests that he thinks of, as the, he thinks of the higher pleasures as mental pleasures, the lower pleasures as bodily pleasure. Third, um, uh, close to the top of this paragraph, and in a way sort of built into the whole discussion, there's another related contrast, right? The contrast between the distinctively human higher pleasure and the animal lower pleasure. So, I mean, if you focus on, 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 you know, our first question, the question of, you know, what sort of characteristics does Mill think the sorts of experience that, that, that end up getting sorted as higher have, and what characteristics does he think the lower ones have, um, you get that from those three contrasts I've just pointed to, you know, higher being, you know, pleasures of intellect, feelings and imagination and moral sentiments, mental pleasures, distinctively human pleasures, lower being pleasures of mere sensation, bodily, animal. Um, there is there's something about 
the way Mill sets up the discussion here that I think is arguably problematic. It's not something that he exactly directly asserts, but it's I think a fairly clear implication of what he does say, right? The fairly clear implication is he thinks that there are important human pleasures that are purely bodily, just like animal pleasures. I think you can make a good case that that's a mistake. So consider, I mean, what would be the most obvious paradigms of lower sensation, pleasures, whatever. Food and sex. Start with food, right? There are, you might say, right, there are some people who eat to live and there are some people who live to eat. The former class, those are people who regard food as just kind of fuel for getting, getting them to do what they want to do, right? And who pay very little attention to it. Those are people for whom the pleasures of eating are not important. Right? On the other hand, the people who live to eat are the people for whom the pleasures of food are important. But then think about what those people tend to be like. Think about sort of the paradigm of the person who is really concerned with food or you know the, the, the probably the easiest popular stereotype to do here is the person who loves wine right so the wine snob on the you know normal depiction is precisely the person who has this elaborate vocabulary for talking about wine right they can talk about you know all these different aspects of the flavor and they like to you know compare different wines to one another and so on and so forth right? so look on the one hand you know that's the person who really enjoys wine right on the other hand, that's also the person whose sort of distinctively human faculties seem to be engaged by wine, right? I mean, if you're someone who um, has, uh, you know, this elaborate way of conceptualizing all these different flavors, you're precisely not someone who enjoys wine the way, I don't know if animals really do enjoy getting drunk anyway, but you know, the way an animal might enjoy getting drunk on wine, right? Um, you see, I think that, I mean, you could make a decent sort of similar case about um, sexual pleasure as well, right? So then the idea would be, uh, oh, Mill is mistaken in thinking that there are important human pleasures that are purely pleasures of sensation, right? I mean, sure, there are sensation elements there, right? But the thought is, um, it's not as if you've got sort of this animal nature, and then there are, there are these sources of pleasure for it, and then you sort of add these distinctively human bits, and then that, you know, that introduces these other sorts of pleasure, but doesn't affect the animal stuff, right? The point is, if you've got these distinctively human faculties, then they influence, you know, all the kinds of pleasure that are important to you, right? Um, so, you know, the right way to see it is not as Mill implicitly suggests that there are important human pleasures that are purely matters of sensation and others that are engage the distinctively human faculties. If you were going to um, make a distinction here, the way to do it would be to say, you know, some of them in involve more of an element of sensation and some of them involve less. But the idea that there are important ones that involve just the sensation stuff is, is arguably wrong. I mean, here's another way, you know, this is more closely related to the, the Bentham thing on pushpin and poetry, right? Um, So you might plausibly think, um, I mean, so both Bentham and Mill, Mill only very narrowly actually, but uh, lived before the era of um, organized professional sport, largely. I mean, professional football, you know, real football that involves the feet and stuff. Uh, professional football in England got going 
um, I think the first FA Cup final was actually the year before Mill died. I have no idea whether Mill had any interest in it. Well, I, you know, I don't suppose that he did. It was not, you know, it's one of those things that looks important in retrospect, but probably, you know, for your average mid Victorian was a, a blip at the time. But anyway, I mean, if you, um, if you sort of develop the view you might expect Mill to take in contrast to Bentham, you might think he'd think, oh, these, you know, people who enjoy uh, football, playing sports, watching sports, well, that's, a, that's a lower pleasure, right? That's not like poetry. Okay? But again, um, there's something sort of, it seems to me, seriously misleading about that, at least, again, if the picture is that the lower stuff doesn't involve the distinctively human faculties, right? Um, I'm not saying it doesn't involve something else as well, but look, um, my wife doesn't like to watch football matches, and that's... Um, oh, I don't know. Ref it, it, that a reflection of that or a symptom of that is she don't really know what's going on, right? I mean, it's not it's not merely that she couldn't explain the offside rule. Right? I mean, you, you know, she, you could, there's the same TV screen in front of her as there is in front of me when I'm watching, but she doesn't she doesn't understand it, you know. Uh, so I get engaged by it in a whole lot of ways that she doesn't, right? And I'm sure that's true of fans of other sports as well, right? So if you're a real fan of those sports. Lots of your distinctively human faculties are being engaged by what's going on, right? I mean, you're just, you know, you are perceiving what's going on in that game in a way that, um, you know, um, my wife doesn't and your dog doesn't and <laughs> so forth, right? I mean, that your distinctively human faculties are being engaged, right? Um, so again, I mean, you know, you sort of, you push at something that you might think was a lower pleasure, Right, and you discover again this this idea that for people for whom that's important, it's not pure sensation or anything. Right, that distinctively human faculties do get engaged by it. Right. So you know this is all by way of criticism, as it were, of something that seems implicit in Mill's treatment of our first question: the idea that there are important human pleasures that are matters of pure sensation. I I, I want to press the point on the other side that. Once you have these distinctively human faculties, then they'll get engaged by anything that's really important to you. I mean, there'll be sensation in there as well, but the idea that it's pure sensation for important stuff um, seems to me problematic. All right, good time to take a break, and then we'll come back and we'll look at the other four questions.